Good morning and welcome to the November 8th, 2022 meeting of the Lecture and Employees Contributory Pension Plan and Trust Committee meeting. My name is Jill Barnett and I am the General Manager of Lextran. Um, as we call this meeting to order, I'll also do a quick roll call uh, for Lextran, Nikki Falkenberry. Here. Paul Schoninger from the Here. board. Here. Fred Combs is absent today. For ATU Local 639, Laura Kelly. Here. Eric Watkins. Here. And Todd Birch. Here. All right, we have a quorum. Uh, do we have an approval of the minutes from the August 9th, 2022 meeting? I make a motion. We have a motion from Ms. Walkenberry. A second? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Schoninger. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition or discussion? Moving on, we will have a fund performance report from Mariner, Mariner Wealth Advisors, and we have Pam Thompson and Michael Gosney with us today. Thank you. All right, thank you all very much. Um, you should have the presentation in front of you. Um, just as a reminder, Mariner Wealth Advisors is managing the investments in the pension portfolio. We are not involved in anything specific to the benefits for any individual recipient. Um, so we're here to talk about just how it's invested in the economic landscape and all of that. Um, so the first couple of pages are just an update on our firm. Um, as a reminder, we are actually a nationwide firm, but Michael and I are coming to you from our Louisville office, um, which is um, one of about um, 75 locations that we have across the country. If you turn to a little bit further to page five, um, we'll zero in on the investment policy for this pension plan. Um, this is a summary and then the full document is on the several pages behind it, but we'll focus here just on the summary. Um, this is your document that gives us the general guidelines by which we go ahead and invest this investment portfolio for you. Um, the most important aspect of that is the asset allocation. So you'll see here at the top, we have targets and ranges for cash, bonds, and stocks. Uh, the largest part of that you'll see is the stock. So the equity part of the portfolio um, is to be between 50 and 80% of the total. Um, that is critically important for growth long term uh, because for this to be paying the benefits that it needs to pay you know, in perpetuity, um, it needs to grow to be able to do that. Um, but because we can have volatility with the stock market, which we've actually had quite a bit of this year, um, it is also important to have a cushion and not have all of it in stocks. Um, so the remainder of the portfolio then is between bonds and cash to give a bit of a cushion to earn some interest um, and it does help to buffer that volatility um, that we can get from the stocks. Everything else about the policy is just to make sure that it is well diversified, not have too much in any one investment, um, very high quality, particularly when we talk about bonds, um, since bonds don't grow, but we need to know that that bond issuer is going to, to pay the bond back on maturity. Um, and so just elements of being prudent and well diversified. Um, so that's the high level. Are there any questions about the policy? So this has not changed in a number of years. That full document is there if you're interested in reading that. Um, but if you turn past that first divider, so past tab one, um, we have a couple of pages just giving the market environment that we have been in, first for stocks. Uh, page 17 is a review. This is last year, kind of ancient history at this point. Um, but it is an important reminder that it was a very strong year in 2021. It was actually the third year in a row that we had above average stock returns, um, which gives a little bit of you know, maybe silver lining as we look at then what has happened this year. Um, if you turn to page 18, um, this is through the end of September. We had not quite yet gotten through October to get this updated for this meeting. Um, but basically the market is down um, significantly. Through the end of September, uh, the S&P 500 was down about 23% for the year. Uh, but really, regardless of any kind of stock, you can see they're slightly different numbers, but all basically moving together. Um, this is a reaction to the primary concern, which is inflation, which has become very high. With inflation comes higher interest rates. The market is reacting to interest rates more than anything else. Um, the causes of the inflation actually started with the out, kind of the, the, what happened with the pandemic. We had a lot of supply shortages among 
a variety of things combined was still very healthy demand. Um, as consumer, there was there was a lot of surplus and you know things that were able to help consumers and help the economy to kind of survive through the pandemic, which we all were very happy about at the time. Uh, but that combined with supply shortages led to the first kind of push up in prices. The second um, was actually the Russia invasion of Ukraine. Um, that is a significant source, both out of Ukraine and out of Russia, of oil, of all sorts of grain and other like basic items that a lot of us weren't even aware of until that happened. And, and it really, again, cutting off a lot of the supply of those things leads to a, a, a spike in prices. When you get a spike in oil prices, it's not just the cost of filling your tank of, of gasoline in your car, it's also, well, what does that mean for the truck that's bringing the groceries to the grocery store or to the items to Walmart or whatever? And, and the prices of all sorts of things could start to go up simply because the price of oil has gone up. The third source of inflation is the one that tends to happen in just a typical economic cycle. When we have a strong economy like we have had, what happens is that the job market gets very tight. And so with unemployment at very low levels, which we've had, um, and a lot of job openings, it has led to a lot of employers needing to raise labor costs or you know wages so that they can keep people and attract people to their companies. As that happens, the typical you know cycle that happens then is those higher cost of hiring people and having people leads to higher prices as companies then try to cover that cost. That's the traditional source of inflation. So when we look at that type of inflation, that is what the Federal Reserve is trying to combat by raising interest rates. So the Federal Reserve is now in a mode of raising rates. They've done it several times. We don't, they're not finished. Um, as that happens, and the expectation for that, that's what the market has been reacting to. So kind of a, a long explanation, but that's the environment that we have been in. Um, as we look at your portfolio then, on page 19, we're looking both at the asset allocation and then we have a summary of the returns. The pie chart is showing the current allocation. We have been um, right in the midst of your range, um, and right now we're at about 73% on the equity side and about 27% on the fixed income side. You can see in the pie chart how that is divvied among a lot of other asset classes within that. Um, looking at the returns, we have done this as updated as we could <laughs> since um, October. We've seen a bit of a, an increase from where we had been in September. Um, so this was printed as of um, the end of last week, so on October 28th. Um, looking year to date through that, that date, the total portfolio was down about 13%, so 12.9%. Um, the biggest part of that was the equity, down 15.8. Um, the fixed income, um, which is bonds, technically has a return of negative 5.5%, as we'll explain in a little bit. We buy individual bonds for you. Each one comes in and matures at its full value. So that is a loss only on paper. It is not an actual loss to the portfolio since we hold a bond until it comes in. It's just the trading prices of bonds can fluctuate leading to a negative return sometimes. Um, but as I mentioned, we had, we've had three actual years of very strong returns prior to this year. So you can see last year the return was 16.9% overall. In 2020 it was 13.6. Um, kind of that rolling five-year number is a little bit lower right now at 5.8% because of the strong drop that we've had. Um, but I think that's pretty close still to the actuarial assumption. Steve, I think is it 6% that you're using? Um, so still pretty close to that. Um, any questions on that? It's been a tough environment. We say it's not as bad as it could have been, but we're, we're still kind of working through that. Um, the next page then just gives a little bit more of an accounting flow looking at the past three years. You know, the, the first column being year to date so far and then the last, uh, the prior two years. Just where the portfolio started cash flows in and out, um, and then this kind of the sources of return, which are dividends and interest, um, and then the market value increase or decrease. So you can see the market value decrease in dollars is a little bit more than what was gained last year. Another way to look at a pullback like this is it's kind of like stepping backwards in time. You know, I have to think of that almost more than just actual loss of money. It's just kind of a flow of time. Um, and then you can see the prior year before that. So we're 
you know, where we would have been a little bit before the start of last year in terms of the market value. Before we leave that page, mm -hmm. can you talk about, or I don't know, maybe it's Nikki, uh, the, the net cash flow for this for the year to date? Yeah, so that's a combination of what's coming in as money comes in and, and, and what's gone out. We, we could try to drill down into that number. But. We had uh, several long-term employees that left that took their pension. Okay, uh, okay, well, that makes me feel better. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's unusual that that happens. Yeah, I think usually it's a net inflow, but it's... Yeah. You know, it's, it's the amounts coming in with, you know, as often as you're all putting money in, but then in the pension payments going out, which is the typical cash flow. Um, the next page shows our individual stocks that are in the actively managed um, slice of the equities. Um, these stocks make up of two thirds of the equity portfolio. As you can see, we uh, break them into different categories. On the far left, we have our growth and income. Um, these are dividend payers, your core dividend payers and dividend growers. Um, those things put together, and these stocks are typically less volatile than the overall market. Um, they're kind of your steady eddy. Uh, then we have our cyclical growth uh, category. These. These positions, these stocks ebb and flow with the economy. They're more sensitive to the economic cycle. Um, with that being said, they are more opportunistic depending on where we are in the economic cycle. Um, the high growth category, um, these, these companies are typically in hyper growth mode based on the business that they're in, uh, based on the sector that, they're, um, that their business is in essentially. Um, they're more focused on, uh, we look at this part of the portfolio as capital, looking for more capital appreciation. Um, so we have kind of a balance between uh, all three on a weighting perspective. Um, and this, these uh, weights can change between growth and income, cyclical and high growth, just depending on where we are in the cycle. Normally we're more of a balanced portfolio. Uh, right now growth had been hit a little bit more um, so we see a few more names in that category um, as of right now. But this can shift and change as part of the active strategy, essentially. Um, the next page um, is our top 10 equity holdings. I like to refer to this as our risk control slide. And um, we're essentially looking for individual um, uh, stock concentration risk. So. Typically, our threshold is around 5%. As you can see, the largest holding is Marathon at 4.4%. So we've got a nice buffer in between there. Um, another thing that I'll point out is the difference between the total cost and the market value. Um, some of these positions, some of these positions, we've held for quite some time. Just to point out, United Healthcare bought it at 29,600. It's now 261,000 dollars. Another one, Lowe's, bought it for $25,000, um, and current value is $201,000. Um, another thing I like to point out on this slide, there's, there's three kind of neat things. Uh, the third one is the diversification between the sectors. Normally you see kind of a, in certain ind indexes, you'll see kind of some tech stock concentration or healthcare or whatever. But you can see we have a nice diversification there. And actually on the next page, it shows it in a pie chart and graphically that we are invested in all the sectors of the economy, the major sectors of the economy, instead of just being concentrated in one sole sector. Um, so it's good to have diversification there as well. Any questions so far? Um, the next page shows our passive investment strategy, and we utilize um, low-cost exchange-traded funds. Um, so we have our active strategy, and then our passive strategy makes up the remainder one-third of the portfolio. We have two large-cap names, um, a growth index and a value index. Um, the mid-cap is a Russell 2000, and then the international is the uh, IFA. Just a short acronym. Um, you can also see that we have the performance year to date and, and for a few years. 
Um, you can see the difference between uh, the growth in the value and the large gap. Um, year to date, um, growth has underperformed, value has, I'll say, outperformed, it's less worse. Um, but to also point out in 2020, growth outperformed quite a bit. So that's one reason why we like to have um, passive investments is for even more diversification. Or we're not just making a, a, an assumption based on one certain part of the portfolio, growth or value. We have a blend between both of them. Um, the last page uh, that I'll cover is the bond review. And as Pam alluded to um, earlier, um, we hold individual, um, individual paper, individual bonds, whether they're corporates, municipals, um, you know, and we hold those positions to maturity. Um, the, as interest rates rise, bond prices go down, but we don't really focus on the price fluctuation because we know at the maturity date, we're going to, we know what we're going to get, and that's the, what's called par value. Um, so that fluctuation is just kind of a, uh, it, it just happens, um, but we don't take losses on bonds. Um, we continue to collect the interest uh, payments, and then once they mature, we then get paid that cash and then reinvest into something else, whether it's another bond position in a different year, or maybe there's a, uh, a distribution coming up, someone's retiring, whatever. Um, we take that and look for other opportunities where that money is needed and necessary. So we're relatively short term on the, on the spectrum. Um, right now it makes sense to stay uh, relatively short term. Uh, as you can see, the one to three years is the majority of the uh, percentage allocation. Um, just where the yield curve is right now, that's what makes the most sense. And that's changing as interest rates are rising. So we can take advantage of higher interest rates as those bonds mature. And I, I will just add one additional piece of information that we had been recently strategically holding on to cash as bonds were maturing, as interest rates have been going up, and we have now just started redeploying that into new bond investments. And now as interest rates have gone up, they might not be finished, but they've come up a lot. Um, buying bonds, in our view, is a great opportunity right now because we can buy a, a high quality corporate bond and get more than 5% for it. I mean, it's been a really long time since, since we've had those kinds of returns. Um, so literally right now, we're in the process of buying more bonds um, with the cash that we will accumulate. So. so that's the kind of the detailed investment review. And then this kind of last section that we'll cover goes into a little bit more of the economic data, um, looking at what is the environment that we've seen, what is our outlook. Um, page 27 is a long-term view of the economy. And I like to differentiate when we talk about the economy, it is not the same thing as the market. And a lot of times in conversation, we kind of get them all mixed together. Um, when we talk about the economy, we're talking about gross domestic products. So GDP is the output of goods and services from our country. Um, so here you're looking at a 10-year chart that you've seen growth over that time. We definitely saw a big drop that occurred with the pandemic. Everything shut down. You can see that, but it came right back and actually accelerated coming out of that. Um, the next page breaks it into a more detailed view quarter by quarter. Um, so this gets reported quarterly. This is looking at what is the percentage increase or decrease that has been reported each quarter for the past few years. Um, this is right now only going through the second quarter of 2022. You'll see we actually did have a negative, um, we had a, a decline in GDP in the first two quarters of this year that came off of a really strong fourth quarter, so we're not super surprised to see just a little bit of a reduction there. Um, the third quarter did come in as a positive number, just to kind of add that um, to that equation. Um, but if you turn to page 29, uh, this, we can see here that tight job market that I was talking about earlier. Um, on the left is a, a chart of U.S. job openings, um, which has come down a little bit, but still very close to pretty record highs. On the right, you see the unemployment rate, which has come all the way down to pretty close to record low levels. Um, this is that tight job market that, that we were talking about that does lead to wages going up and therefore inflation going up for those reasons. It's kind of the typical economic cycle. 
So on page 30 is then showing what does, what does the inflation number look like? This is looking at CPI, which is the Consumer Price Index. On page 30, we're looking at a 40-year history of that CPI increase rate that gets reported every month. Um, and you can see we're at very high levels right now, uh, roughly 9%, um, that we have not seen levels as high in about 40 years. Um, so that is the concern, that is what has happened and, and led to this volatility that we've seen. Um, the next page again breaks it into a little bit more detailed view. This is looking at the month to month inflation increase versus the year over year increase. Um, if we look at it monthly here, we can see that these past couple of months and then the, the um, September number was a 0.4, so it was a little bit higher. Um, we're, it's, it's too soon to be able to say for sure, but we're a little encouraged that at least that new monthly number has started to come in at a lower level. So that once we get through, you know, the next year, if it's if it's still very low, we'll, we'll be getting into lower overall numbers. Um, so that that is what we are watching, and, and the market is watching very closely. Um, the next page shows consumer sentiment. Um, despite the fact that we have a very strong job market, and most people are employed if they want to be, um, we actually have a 50-year low in consumer sentiment as measured by the University of Michigan in their survey. Um, that is due to the expectation for inflation. Um, and this can all start to become almost a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way. The market volatility can also lead to people just being a little more nervous and maybe you know holding on to holding on to money more than just spending it, and so that can, in turn, can, you know, add to the, to the slowdown in the economy that we can see. Um, so that is you know, part, part of what we're factoring in here as well. Um, page 33, I think we probably went over this last time, but just as a reminder, as we look at the market, we are currently in a bear market, so we call this, all this terminology, but when we have a decline of 20% from the last high, that is what we call a bear market. This looks at every bear market for the past 100 years. Um, we've had several of them, but it's just showing when did it start, when did it end, how long did it last in months, how much did the market drop in total, and how long did it take to recover to the previous high. Um, if we average these and take out some of the extremes, such as the Great Depression, um, what we would consider a reasonable average is at the very bottom that's highlighted in yellow. Um, that the average has been about 12 months, um, a drop of about 28%, and it has on average taken about 10 months to recover the previous high. Um, if we look at where we are now, we, we had gotten to pretty close to that 28%. As of today, we're down 20%. Um, and the um, length of time, the last high that we had was in January. So we're already you know, 11 months into this um, bear market. So. This, we can't turn this into a prediction, but if it helps at all, you know, based on history, it would give, you know, maybe a little bit more credence to possibly, you know, being almost finished with this. But what, the one thing I also say is a lot of talk about recession in the economy. Um, there is a good chance we're already in one, um, just because of the weakness in a lot of areas. Um, if we aren't, most economists are expecting that we will be. And so the thing to, to remember about that, or I'd say the most important thing from an investment perspective, um, is that the market is always looking out into the future. So when we look at the stock market, the decline that we have already had and are dealing with right now is the kind of decline that, that could very well be done with what's gonna happen in the next recession. So the, the, the market decline happens first, when we go into a recession, most of the time in, in history when we've been declared to be in a recession, the market has already bottomed and is actually on its way back up. Because the stock market is looking at, well, what's next? What's out six to nine months in the future? So the decline we've already had in stocks could very well be all that we get, even as we go into a recession, because it, it happens ahead of time. Um, so just to keep that in mind. If, if they come out and say, oh, guess what, we're in a recession now, that is that is not a reason that we would expect the market to go through a whole other decline. Um, that's what the market is already priced in. So the last page that we have been showing almost every time is that reminder of how often we do get a pullback in the market. 
Um, so this is just a, a chart of gray bars and red dots, but the, the gray bars are showing the, the year by year increase or decrease in the S&P 500, so the overall market going back to 1980. 75% of those have been positive, that's what we expect. The market goes up about 75% of the time on a year by year basis. But there's a red number underneath, and that is showing you during that year, what was the largest drop that we saw from high to low at some point during the year, things continued on and finished wherever that gray bar is. So if you focus on the red numbers, you will see that many, many times we get really big drops. On average, um, it's on average every year that it's about 10%, uh, frequently more than that. A 10% drop is what we call a correction, which is kind of what we're focused on in this chart. But you'll see many times that it has been down significantly and still finishes positive for the year. Um, so it is, it is normal. It's a part of just how the market ebbs and flows over time. Um, so that's where we say it's important to at least you know, acknowledge and understand that that's how the market is going to flow. Uh, but it's another reason why it's so important to make sure that the balance in the portfolio is appropriate. And so having that cushion that's from the bonds that are, that are then helping to buffer that volatility helping to make sure that the pension payments can always be made. We don't have to sell stocks while they're down by 20% in order to do that. So we're managing that balance um, between the different parts of the portfolio. So we will stop there. Are you happy to answer any other questions that people have them? So you think the outlook's pretty bright, though, at this point? We're, yeah, that's a great question. We would say by this time next year, <laughs> We would expect, right now, we would expect the economy has probably had its recession and economically, hopefully, <laughs> start to climb back up. Climbing back up. The market, it's, it's so hard to predict. You know, we I can't, understand. We, we would say there is a good chance we're just about done with this market uncertainty and decline. Um, the market is waiting to see that the economy is actually slowing down. And we have this conundrum that happens at this part, this part of the cycle where you know, the, the, the market is watching the news and what's the latest jobs report. And if you've noticed, maybe you've noticed that on a day that we get a really strong jobs report, meaning low unemployment, a lot of jobs were created, that should be good news. Like We should all be happy about that fundamentally. The market has been negative on those days because that is saying that, oh gosh, the job market is still tight. The Federal Reserve is going to keep raising interest rates because they're not seeing that slowdown. So we're in this conundrum right now where strong economic <laughs> reports are actually negative for the market. Um, so we take that as a sign that maybe we're getting closer to where it's going to be done. Um, that type of you know, mis mismatch doesn't tend to last all that long. Um, but, but the market is waiting to see evidence that things are slowing down enough that the interest rates can stop going up. And that's when we would expect that the market will probably The inflation down. slows that some uh, with the amount of, I mean, it's unprecedented inflation right now. It is unprecedented. Yeah, the, it is. Well, that's what the concern it, except that, for that like we the 70s and 80s. That yeah. we hear from our people, the concern is the value of our dollar right. and our benefit is shrinking. Exactly. And it continues to shrink. So that's exactly. the, uh, how does that play into the growth? I mean, things cost more, prices don't go down generally when there's inflation. Right. Right. How, how does that play? Yeah, yeah, like people, in the outlook, people are saying things are going to be more expensive. My dollar is not worth as much. Yeah. Are you asking like from a market perspective? Or yeah. I mean, how uh, people aren't going to be as as uh, liquid as they were. They exactly. Can't, they can't spend. Yeah. As I mean, much and there's, as there's, they a could. Of, there's a lot. There's a lot. Even of even um, a year from now. Right. Say, right. So once the prices go up, we'd love to see them come back down. Yeah. But we have very much doubt that they will. Yeah, and there, there's a lot of impacts of that, you know, so it comes through in what can consumers buy, right? So it, it means that the, what, the, the discretionary things usually get dropped first, you know, so from an investment perspective, we're watching, okay, you know, certain consumer discretionary stocks might not do as well, but it's the, the staples, the things that people have to have, and they're going to continue to buy as they prioritize what they spend um, from a stock-by-stock -stock perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, for a lot of companies, you know, in a, in a broader sense, it means revenues can be compromised, but it's based on 
the volume of what people buy, but they're raising the prices, you know, the, the, the total revenue can still, still do okay. Um, if we have a long period of high inflation, and right now we're not expecting that, um, if it really went on for a really long time, I mean, you, you do get to where people who are looking to invest are looking for where can I grow to stay ahead of that inflation, and even though bond rates are now you know, higher than 5% for a corporate bond, if that's still lower than inflation, that's maybe not as attractive as still putting it into stocks or other things that will continue to grow. So it can, on the flip side, start to be better for stocks if people are just looking for where can they put their money to grow, and by putting it in, it makes it grow. So there's a lot of competing variables there. Thank you. Yeah. Never a dull moment. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions or comments from the committee? Well, what we hear from the people we represent, of course, is the thinking um, you know, The value or the uh, benefit hasn't right, raised here in 11 years. So, what was worth $50 11 years ago, yeah. according to taking all the interest rate, and it's an unprecedented time limit, so the, is worth about I think it said 39% less, uh, or it's, uh, I'm sorry, 31.95% less is the value of our dollar. So what, in, in this, according to the Consumer Price Index, what was worth $50 in 2011, you need $65 today. Yeah. So there's no cost of living built into our pension. Um, but it's worded that way. So the long term, is that it gets, we keep them the same, and it gets smaller and smaller. And of course, you all don't have a whole lot to do with that. Right. But what the people we represent are concerned about <clears throat> is that we're not keeping up with the cost of living. Our pension, when I started here 10 years ago, was $50, now it's not worth that. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So it, it, it continues to shrink. If something doesn't happen in the cost of living, or some type of bump in the cost of living, this thing might be worth 10 bucks in another 10 years. Yeah. That's, the, the, that's what we're hearing. That's what the, the complaint is from the people that we represent. <clears throat> so I don't know if, it, Steve, is that something you want to address? You're talking about the promotion of the $50. Yes, sir. Exactly. Yeah. We, we actually were doing it through October 28th to be as up to date as possible. Let me find that number again. Uh, now 12.9, 12 basically through October. And Steve, can you remind us, can you remind us at, um, when the benefit increased in 2011, what had it been at that time? It was $40 and it went to 50 Okay, thank you. What kind of raise in the contribution rate would we need to cover? Let's see. From the quote you gave us before, it looked like about a dollar fifty to bring it to sixty-five, which would cover the inflation over the last eleven years. Would actually would cover a little bit more.
I didn't, I didn't hear how much you said the increase would have to be, Steve. Steve, can you re please repeat that? You said for a $10 increase in the benefit for people who have not yet retired, what would the necessary increase in contribution be? One dollar. One dollar. That's per pay period? That would be per pay period per, per employee? Hour. Per, hour. per hour. Per hour. It's based on My 310 point. hours, Nikki. It's, it's, it's per hour. Right, but overall it would be uh, based on 310 hours. No, it would be based on 2,080 hours annually. Oh, right, but overall for the entire company, 310,000 hours. So we're looking at a, a cost increase of over 300,000 hours Correct. per year. Or a little more than that, actually. That's what we're asking. We're, we're asking that the authority does that. Because uh, this, I mean, our, we're, we have an election tomorrow for a new president. One of the nominees, that's his whole format, is to raise this pension. That's, he, he's promoting people to get on board with that, with the pension. And, uh, because it hasn't grown, I mean, the, the, the benefit hasn't grown, and it continues to shrink. And for a, a long-term outlook for me, that's kind of scary. You know, I think it's probably scary for everyone. So that's that's what we're asking the authority is to uh, um, do a bump for this cost of living, and eventually work in some type of cost of living every year to, to get, keep up with it cost of living in terms of? Well, year to year. Do you mean to the contribution or? To the contribution. So the year to year, you see from 2011, the inflation rate was 316. 2012, it was 207. 2013. So in the long term, and I know this is something that has to be discussed and there's nothing can be made today, but that's, in the long term, that's what we would like to see. We want to catch up and see if we can work in a cost of living to keep the pension moving forward. So this, and, and with the current situation, uh, we have to make this appealing to, to our people, you know, to the people coming in, because we're, we're shorthanded. It's everywhere, it's everybody's problem, but we have to make our position more appealing to the people coming in. And that's, and this is what we're hearing from the people that are here. Right. The, the, the benefit's not, not growing, it's shrinking. Yeah. To, to your to your comments, Todd, like you and I have talked about before, the contribution on both um, the union member side and the, the authority side, the contribution is negotiated through the collective bargaining I, I, process. I, I Th I that's, that's the contribution. The benefit is um, decided upon by the committee, which is both union members and um, members of the company. Who also who are also contributing employees, um, you know, uh, Miss Walkenberry and Mr. Combs also contribute to the pension as well. Um, so we can decide to raise this right now. The benefit to sixty five dollars. If you did, though, you would be asking employees to reduce their take home pay by a dollar per we're, hour. We're not asking that. We're asking you to do this. That's what's negotiated. Yeah, we're asking you to do this. But how does that, that how does that fit into the people like yourself who have a different benefit? She doesn't have a different, have a different benefit. benefit. Well, she doesn't, but it, it's the same, but they have a match on their 401k. So that may, doesn't that play in somehow how that decision would be made? Not with the pension. The 401k well, is something well, different. Well, yeah, but that seems like a conflict of interest. It seems Which like a conflict of interest. So their long term, their long term outlook includes their pension and their 401k. Mm -hmm. Our long-term outlook it, it includes our pension and 401k with no match. So there's a, there's a difference in money, that free money to them from their employer that goes into their future that we don't get. Um, so, do, you, do you see what I'm saying? I, I hear you. I, I hear what you're so saying. When, when it comes to, when we say negotiation, how are we supposed to negotiate for them? We have on, the exact on the same benefits that yeah. you do. 
the, the pension benefit is the same. But, but doesn't, for, their, doesn't their voice, couldn't their voice possibly say, we, we don't want this? Because. On the pension side? No. When you say we don't want what? We, we don't want the increase in the pension because the money is better spent in our 401k because we get a, we, isn't that a conflict of interest? So that's another thing that we hear. It says, it says that a quorum is made up of people who have different retirement benefits than we do. The benefit's not different in terms of the pension. I, I hear the, what you're saying, you see what I'm with saying. with the 401k. Right. Um, again, request, uh, requesting a match on your 401k would be something that would happen through part of the bargaining process, and I if I recall, did not happen. Um, so again, the contribution amount is, is, uh, takes place in the negotiation process. The benefit is decided upon in this group, um, and, and then voted on finally by the board. So, you know, that, that is certainly something that could be brought up as a new business item. Um, That's what, you know, what we're, we're asking is for I'm not, I guess I'm, this, I'm unclear. Point, I'm unclear on what you're asking. Are asking, you asking to increase the benefit or, or to increase the contribution? Increase, if we're going to increase it to 60, we're asking Lextran to pay the dollar. Then we would need to go back to the bargaining table. I mean, it's a question for Steve. Has there ever been an evaluation of having the benefits just linked to inflation? Is, do you know if anybody's ever looked at that? Do a COLA? Steve, are you saying that the built-in cost of living is in the benefit or in the contribution? You could amend the plan. Well, I understand that, but you said in Kentucky there's there's been a built-in cost of living. Were you saying in the benefit or in the contribution level? In the uh, benefit level. So okay. So is it fair to say any time that there, if, if it was ever to be agreed upon to add a cost of living to this, at the time that that cost of living increase or the, the donation or the uh, contribution, it could also bring up the benefit at the same time? Right. That's feasible. So the benefit can grow as the contribution We just wanted our position to be known. Thank you. Thank you. Steve, anything else that you want to add? No? Is there any additional old business or new business brought forth today? I just have one question. Why are we so heavily invested in Tesla Incorporated, or why are you so heavily invested in Tesla Incorporated for growth? 
given the volatility yeah. of that entire it, company? It's, it's actually not a large position. It was at the top of that page just because it has the highest growth rate of the company. Um, the positions are actually in that last section. I mean, is that where you're looking? Yes. Um, so they're actually in order of the position size. Mm -hmm. I'm going to look for Tesla. It's actually one of the smaller positions. Um, it's, it's only 0.6% it's of the portfolio. So it's actually not a large position. Um, that was actually one where, and a couple, we didn't get into a whole lot of detail, but as we were as we've been going through this environment, we've been looking for opportunities. You know, so we bought Tesla, let's say back in June or July, um, on a pretty big drop that they've had. So we're actually up a lot in that stock. Um, we bought it when it had come down. But it's, it's a pretty small position in terms of, compared to the other stocks in there. Uh, just curious, curious more or anything else. Okay. Any other items to be brought forth today? Hearing none, I would call for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Mr. Schoninger, is there a second? Second. Ms. Lockenberry, all in favor? Aye. Okay, I will stand adjourned. <laughs>